Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Yavana Knezhevich, and I am the Associate Director uh, at the Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies here at Stanford. And uh, I would like to warmly welcome you uh, to our inaugural event of the 2021-2022 uh, academic year. Uh, and we are thrilled to be starting uh, this year uh, with this event um, featuring uh, uh, Grzegorz uh, Kwiatkowski, um, whom I believe we will be calling Greg today, if I am not uh, mistaken, uh, who will be in dialogue today with um, our very own uh, Cynthia L. Haven. Uh, she is the author of uh, Chesval Miłosz, A California Life, which is <laughs> forthcoming with Berkeley's Heyday Books. Uh, and she is currently working on an anthology for uh, French theorist uh, René Girard, uh, a longtime faculty member uh, of Stanford uh, for the Penguin Modern Classics series. Uh, she's also author of the first ever biography of Girard, uh, Evolution of Desire, A Life of René Girard. And uh, she's a former National Endowment for the Humanities uh, Public Scholar. Uh, so today's event, um, just in terms of format, uh, the first 40 minutes will be a conversation uh, between Greg and uh, Cynthia. And then we will move to a, a Q&A where you will be able to um, have your questions uh, addressed by our speakers. Uh, so at any time during the event, um, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen uh, to send us your questions and um, they will be addressed towards the end of our event. So once again, uh, a hearty welcome and um, without further ado, I will pass it over to uh, Cynthia. Welcome everyone. Uh, people in the know know him. Uh, that's what his English translator, Peter Constantine, told me recently. Uh, Grigorz Kwiatkowski is becoming one of the most vital poetic voices from today's Poland, with six volumes of acclaimed poetry and translated editions on the way. His translator added, he has a strange poetic voice, very original and stark. Greg is also a celebrated musician. His internationally known post-rock band Trupa Trupa has been featured on NPR, The Guardian, Rolling Stone, and elsewhere. He has called his music a vital pessimism, which shows the rather dark and frightening sides of human nature. His minimalist poems explore not only the conflicted pasts of Europe, for example, the Nazi euthanasia program, but also the paradoxes of contemporary genocides uh, in Rwanda, for instance. His poems have been perceived as quasi-testimonies, provocative and lyrical utterances delivered by the dead. Yale critic Richard Deming said that his work reveals that the unforgettable is also the undeniable. Is it beautiful? I say it is powerfully necessary, unrelentingly direct. I say it burns. Greg has hosted workshops at Oxford and lectured at Berkeley, the University of Chicago, Johns Hopkins, and other venues. Crops, his first collection in English, will be published by Rain Taxi next month. So all welcome, Greg. Um, let me start this way. Which came first, music or poetry? Or did they both come at the same time? Did the same forces shape you in each medium? Uh, firstly, nice to, nice to meet you and nice to talk with you. And it's a great, great honor to be in such a great prestigious uh, place and, uh, and especially to, to talk with you and of course with the audience, but <clears throat> yeah. I, I guess that the, 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 the music came first and uh, when I was when I was a child I was going to a musical school I, I was playing on clarinet and saxophone etc but and then then uh, the poetry came much more later but of course good writing or good poetry is also the the matter of a rhythm and the music so uh, after all and now I think this is almost one thing. I mean, the, 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 my lyrical life in the Trupa Trupa band is almost the same as my poetical 
um, life and uh, and lives. So so I think th th these two worlds are almost one world. But of course, in my writing, I am the 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 only person who is deciding what is good or not. And in Trupa Trupa, we've got democratic structure structure so there are four people we are voting and we are discussing a lot of argues but you know that that that's make us um, i think powerful and and full of friendship friendship and love vibes so yeah but anyway i think that the poetic world and music musical world is is a, is a one world really and it's year after year it's closer um i want a little show and tell at this moment uh, I understand you have some unusual methods for composing poetry. You're using a Nokia cell phone. Can you show it to us? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah actu actually, this is the very, very, um, my very uh, big love. So my, my, my cell phone, which, which is actually, it's very old and it's dead. It, it was always dead, really. So it, 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 it's uh, not connected to any... Mm, network uh, and it's really hard to write on it because it's super hard to uh, to press the button it's it's uh, full of dirt and dust and uh, so the point is it's super hard to write on such old stuff and because of it I have to be more lapidar and lapidar because I'm lazy so you know instead of writing 10 sentences or 20 images or visions, I have to do it in super short lapidar way because it's too hard to press these this, um, old buttons. So, so yeah, yeah. So, so maybe because of this old equipment and my laziness, I, I, I'm more and more lapidar and more and more uh, in some way direct. Uh, yeah, and so, so, so this is my, this is my in some way best friend, right? How old is this phone? Just out of curiosity. For me, I don't know, 15 years for sure. <laughs> so. um, you grew up in Gdansk, a city that had a huge influence on you. And that's also a city with a lot of 20th century history. Uh, both World War II and solidarity began there. Uh, you've said a weed like this could only exist in Gdansk. I think you were referring to yourself. Can you explain to us a little bit of uh, what the city is like? Most people haven't been there, and and how it influenced you. I think I think this this, this is uh, this is great, beautiful city uh, on one hand, and it's it's uh, a lot of great nature. This is by the sea, a lot of forests all around, and uh, great beautiful forests and hills and. Yeah, but but on the, 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 it was uh, for 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 some some um, bigger than 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 uh, um, smaller time. It was a German city, and Second World War started in Gdansk. So this is very tragic history. Uh, Stuttgart concentration camp is, is is not far away from Gdansk, so it's also very tragic history. But on the other hand. The solidarity movement, the workers' movement, was established in Gdansk, and uh, so we've got also these uh, optimistic, great events that uh, changed the world. So I, I think this is great city to live because we've got this mixture, strange mixture of beauty because of nature, bloody history because of bloody history, but also optimistic history because of solidarity movement. So I think this is great mix of in some way to, to observe the changes uh, in the history. And, uh, and I think that people in Gdansk are very special in the way that we are not better than others, but, we, that, but I think we are quite open-hearted and open-minded. We are not very uh, right-wing. We are, anyway, I don't want to polarize and to say who is wrong or bad, but I think this is very, I think this is very open-hearted city and, uh, and, and that's why the solidarity movement uh, was established uh, in, in this place. So. Uh, the, the word that your translator kept using to describe your poems uh, is stark. Uh, they could easily have become histrionic or moralistic, but they're not. Um, how do you do that? And I thought maybe at this moment, it's good for you to read one of your poems. Um, I was thinking of the title poem of your new collection, Crops, 
And if you could read it for us in Polish too, because we'd like to hear the sound of the sound in Polish. All right. So first Polish version. Plony. Nasz prawdziwy zawód to rolnictwo, nie zabijanie. Chociaż przyznaję, rzezie na bagnach odbywały się w rytmie prac sezonowych i kiedy były duże deszcze, nie wychodziliśmy po plony. And now English version translated by, by Peter Constantin. Crops. Our real work is farm work, not killing. Although I admit the massacres in the swamps have the rhythm, rhythm of our seasonal labor. And when the rains were heavy, we did not go out for crops. Very short as you can see or hear. Can you tell us, um, we'll explore the subject matter that you explore in these poems, but could you tell us a little bit about what's going on in the Polish in, in terms of the structure of the poem? I think you've used, you've compared it to Glenn Gould and that's an intriguing uh, comparison too. Uh, I, I think the, the, the point of, of, of this poem, but I guess that the point of the most of the poems are, is, the, is, the, is the, the voice. I mean, the, the voice is very neutral. And uh, firstly, this is a, a, written in the methodology of lyric, ly lyric of masks. So for me, Edgar Lee Masters and his Spoon River Anthology is, is one of the biggest mm, book ever written. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and uh, so, so, so this is the first point. But second point is um, the very neutral tone, tone, tone without melodramatic aspects. And uh, mm, I think that these kind of neutral, that's why I'm com comparing it to Glenn Gould. Of course, I'm not comparing myself to Glenn Gould. I'm not so stupid, but but I, I really love Glenn Gould and I'm listening to Glenn Gould for, for let's say 10 years. And um, and he, he's playing in a very neutral uh, mathematical way. And you, you can feel almost lack of emotions, but because of this feeling of lack of emotions, you 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 you're starting to thinking where are these emotions you know and, and there is uh, um, something inside of you is going on and I, and I think the point is that when you're talking about such drastic situations as, as genocide and such dramatic uh, situations when you're using this neutral voice uh, then uh, it's uh, it provokes you to to, to ask yourself about some, something, you know, that, that if it would be melodramatic or if it would be, you know, if I, I, I would like to make a, a dramatic impact on the reader, I think it wouldn't work. But, but this neutral tone is almost provocative in some way because of its neutrality. Um, let's go back to Gdansk for a moment. It's only a few mo dozen miles from the uh, Stutthof concentration camp from World War II. Tell us a little, it's a long story, but um, about the half a million shoes that you found and how the museum there was established. Yeah, this, this is also, this, this is very, very drastic and dramatic situation. It, it, it has got a lot to do with my, my family because my grandfather was a prisoner of a, a Stutthof concentration camp and his sister was a prisoner of concentration, uh, Stutthof concentration camp. And many years after that, we, me, me and my friend were making a documentary movie about Mr. Albino Soski, and who was a prisoner of a uh, Birkenau concentration camp. But anyway, his brother was a prisoner of a Stutthof concentration camp. And that was, that's why we were shooting uh, in this area. Uh, and uh, yeah, and we found thousands of shoes and, 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 and more of shoes. And after all, these were shoes. Stutthof was a reparation center uh, of shoes, uh, reparation center for all concentration camps in Europe. So, so uh, Red Army, when they liberated the camp, they numbered the, that it was half a million pairs of shoes. And in 60, 1967, when the museum was, was uh, established, they took part of these shoes for exhibition and 
most of them they removed uh, outside of the museum territory. Uh, yeah, and, and they were just there like a trash for for uh, many, many years. So we found them and we tried to make something to secure these artifacts of genocide, but uh, we, did, we, we didn't succeed. So, so we were fighting for a few years uh, with the help of journalists and uh, scholars and, and uh, to make something with this, uh, with this shocking situation. But after all these shoes were in some way secured because they, for, after many years, they were uh, taken from this place, from this forest. Mm, and they were, as far as I know, buried once more uh, on the territory of uh, Stutthof Museum, which is for me super silly and super shocking because it's, it's we can't see it. It's, it's buried, it's, it's hidden, it's hidden. It's, for me, this is a very, very sad, sad, sad thing. And of course, it's got a lot of, a lot of to do with my, with my grand, grandfather and with his sister and with my father, because the, 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 this, this, this is a very special place for me because when I was a kid, I was uh, with my grandfather who first time after the war, he came to this camp with me and he was reconstructing, crying and shouting and, you know, he showed all his mixed emotion. So for me, I, I, I was in a deep shock because I really didn't know what, what to do and, and what is going on. And, and in some way, now I can see that the that, that, uh, rest of my life was really affected. And, and this event had big feedback on, on my music on my poetry and my family and my wife, you know, on, on, on literary everything, because this, uh, this uh, ability of human beings to kill each other, you know, for me, this is the, in some way, I'm, I'm most focused on this scandal, scandalic situation. So, 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 so it, it, it created me in some way, but on the other hand, I'm not the same as my grandfather in the way, in the, in the, in the, in the way that he was very traumatized, traumatized and uh, his sister was mentally ill and he was broken. So my father was not so traumatized, but he, he, he's not so open, but let's say it's, it's, it's all good or, or in, uh, it's okay. But I'm, as you can see, I, I, I'm, I, I, I can talk about it and I can think about it and I can try to work on it. Uh, so, and I try to make something with this family tragic situation and by trying to understand it, I create an art. So this is the, the, the process. You've said that your father, um, you've written about your father and his sister. The story of Poles conscripted by the Germans, um, we don't hear so much about that. And we don't know those stories that, you know, they were basically prisoners uh, forced to work for the Germans. And you said she, your great aunt went crazy and he became a quiet hidden man and that he was uh, lived in a trauma state and that his sister became mentally ill. Uh, what did this look like to you as a child and how did it affect you growing up? You've said a little about that, but I'm wondering if you could expand on it. Yeah, you know, it's, it's because I, I can't make a, um, now when I, when, I, when, when, I, when, I, when I'm a poet, when I'm writing a poetry and I create a music, I, I can easily say about it, but, but I, I think it, of course it made me super focused on, on, on this stuff, but I, I, I think I wasn't affected in so big way that I was broken, for example, because I was really full of life, uh, child and a bit spoiled and, uh, you know, I, I, I was totally not broken, maybe too spoiled. So, so um, and, 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 and but for sure, for example, my relation with my grandfather was not a good relation. You know, I, I, I would even say that I didn't like my grandfather when I was a child because I didn't like my grandfather because he didn't show me a lot of emotions and, and I didn't understand why. So, you know, I preferred the other grandfather, you know what I mean, or gra other grandmother who was uh, much more full of love, etc. But of course, when I was older, then I started to understand this whole when I was when I started to read 
about genocide, about camps, because when I was older, I started to make research, big, big research about it. So, so after many years, I started to, not that I fully understand his horror, but, but I, I think that I understand that he more and more, and now I think I, I quite I understand him so, so, but of course, now it's too late because, because he's not alive, but, but uh, yeah, but in, in some big way, he, he, he created me and this, this, this very bad situation created me. On the other hand, my other grandpa and, and uh, grandmother was kind of opposite emotional types. So I was, uh, on, from this side, I was spoiled. So I had all, always this mixture of something dramatic and something joyful. And I think you can also taste it in this poetry and art that it's in some way um, a mixture of, of, of something very tragic and some opposite stuff. Um, you have said, I am not a moralist. As a third generation, I am simply trying to understand what happened in the past and what is increasingly happening around me now. Um, what does it mean to be third generation? And um, what do you see it happening increasingly now that is uh, concerning you? You know, it, for me to being a third generation is, is to being the first generation really to try, to, which is trying to understand uh, not only the past, so the, the, the history of my family, but also the situation all around and I, and, and I, now I can pretend that I'm a smart guy and I understand stuff, but, but many things happened to me very late. Uh, I mean, conscious uh, issues. And, and, and for example, the assassination and, uh, of president of uh, Gdańsk, uh, Paweł Adamowicz, because he was murdered uh, on the charity event uh, in the city of Gdańsk. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it totally shocked me. Of course, it shocked I guess most of people in Gdańsk and a lot of people in Poland, but he was uh, murdered, in my opinion, because uh, there was a lot of hate speech around his person for almost two years. So, so there was a lot of at media attacks on him and, and it's all, all, always very risky if someone is attacking some, someone in, in such big uh, evil, cheap way and so so anyway the, the maybe some madman or not madman i don't know i'm not a psychiatrist but but uh, took it uh, as a good argument to kill him so for me it was a uh, uh, firstly it was very tragic and secondly it was it was uh, uh, for me kind of like it, it was like like moral awakening that I, I i really thought that it's not only about the past and it's not only about uh, my my fa family, and it's not only about Second World War, but it's uh, also about uh, nowadays situation. And it, it was the time when when the, the president was Donald Trump, and and you know it was also for me a, a moral awakening. You know that someone like Donald Trump is a president, and someone like like him can lie in such a big way, and and nothing is happening. You know what I mean? That, He's doing this and that and this, and he's a president of the United States, and everyone is talking about impeachment, but it's not happening, etc. So for me, it was like a one big victory of evil forces. But of course, it's not easy. To, it's very easy to say who is evil and who is good, but it's. it's I, I think it's of course more more complicated. But anyway, uh, uh, for two or three years, I really think about the the, the past as a. You know, the, 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 this this bloody past can be really more and more visible in the present. So so it's a bit frightening. But on the other hand, it also also make me to want to protest and to be active and to talk. For example, uh, today or tonight, in Gdansk tonight. So so <laughs> yeah. Um, before we wander too far away from your grandfather, um. You've recently made a discovery that has changed your perceptions of that history too. Um, and in fact, you feel like he somewhat prefigured your work. Um, could you share with us what you found? Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's so, so I found uh, that uh, 
kind of notes made by my uh, grandfather and uh, by an accident, I, I, I found a uh, um, few sentences in, in the book published by Stutthof Museum. And there was a few sentences written by my grandfather and I uh, didn't know about them. So after all, I discovered that they had whole pages of his uh, memories from the camp. So, so uh, I've got a copy of it and, uh, and it was for me Mm, totally, uh, yeah, it, it was a big shock because, for example, I didn't know that he was working in the camp hospital and he was moving dead bodies outside of outside of this hospital. So it was his kind of everyday job. So, so for me, his trauma was even more visible. Uh, so, but the, the most shocking thing for me is that that. He, I am writing a bit in the way that he was writing and I didn't know his writing. So um, he's, he's writing in a very ironical, maybe cynical, absurdical way. And, uh, but of course it's not about ironies and cynicism, but, but, but he's using this methodology to, to show some moral problems. And uh, I, I'm trying to do the same, but of course I didn't know that he was doing that. So for me, because I believe in genetic memory, so I, I, I think it's got also a lot to do with that because you know, I, I didn't talk with my grandfather a lot because he didn't talk with anyone a lot. So, so I, I, I couldn't know this uh, form of narration because, because we, we, were, we weren't speaking. So, yeah. Um, you had that one passage. I don't know if you have it handy from uh, your father's <laughs> diary that I, you know, it's just very short. Yes, yeah, so I can read in Polish, right? And, and, and uh, well, you, could, you, could, you could take a stab at English too. I don't have it, I don't have it handy. Okay. All right, the Polish is Komando las dla mnie skończyło się zmiażdżeniem trzech palców lewej ręki, ale z braku temperatury nie kwalifikowałem się do otrzymania pomocy zamiast której zostałem skopany. And the English version. Forest commando detail for me ended with crushing three fingers of my left hand, but having no fever, I did not qualify to receive help, instead of which I was kicked. Uh, yeah, and, and for me this, you know, this absurdical anti-world and anti-ethics world, this is there. That it, he should receive a, a medical help, but instead of that, he was kicked. And this was the reality of concentration camps. You know, and and uh, yeah, but there are a lot of these kind of notes. And, uh, and, and for me, it's, 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 uh, it's a really big thing and I have to study, study it more. Um, yes, you were talking about genetic memory that's occurring in your own family now too, do you feel uh, is it okay for me to ask about that story? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you, you, you mean about the story of my wife, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I've, it's not that I don't have a problem. I've got some problems. But on the other hand, I think that, that we, 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 we can try to face these dark mm, places. So, yes. Yeah, so, so just by an accident, many years ago, I found out that... that uh, that family of my wife is a is a Jewish family, and but it was a secret also for them. So they grant my wife's grandmother was hiding in the forest near Zeshov during the Second World War, and uh, yeah, and, and when I asked her, because I just asked her by an accident, what were you doing during the war time, and she said, I was of course I was hiding in the forest. Where so near the Zeshuf, and, and 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 so I asked her. So may, maybe you're a Jewish person. And she said, "I hate Jewish people." Uh, I saw when I was a child. I saw two two Jewish boys who stole Holy Communion from a church, and they uh, crushed uh, this Holy Communion on the middle. Uh, so I said, "I know the story. This is the medieval ages pogrom stories, you know." So so anyway, we didn't continue. We we didn't talk about it more. It, it, it was. She didn't want to talk about it. The whole family didn't want to talk about it. Until now, they don't want to face it. And they've got a right to do it, in a way. No, not in the way. They've just got a right to do it. Don't. 
but I've got to write to, you know, to, because I've got a son, almost three years old, French Chocolat, so this is also his uh, roots, and this is also his, uh, this is also his history of family, so I, I'm, I'm really interested in that. And yeah, and this, and this is really tragic that in some way, I think that in some way they, they don't, they are afraid to, 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 to say about it and to, to uh, because, you know, Polish is still a very anti-Semitic country and, and, you know, and, and after the war it was, it was also very anti-Semitic and in, in 46 there was a um, pogrom, uh, Kielecki and, you know, and for just an example, I will not tell the names, but one of my best friends, you know, you know, one of my best friends, his grandfather was living in Kielce and then he moved to Wrocław. So I, I asked about it and he said, my grandfather moved in 46 to Wrocław. And he said, and he changed the name. So I said, why he changed the name? And he said, I never thought about that. He just changed the name. And I asked him, you know, so maybe you can make some research about it because maybe he was involved in this Kielce program. And after all, he made the research and he was. You know what I mean? He was one of the, most probably he was one of the perpetrators and he just escaped from uh, Kielce to Wrocław under the new name. So there are a lot of these kind of stories in Poland. Uh, and uh, of course, there are a lot of these kind of stories, you know, in, in, in France or in, especially in, in Germany. But, but, but I am a Polish people and I would like to face problems of Poland. You know what I mean? It's, this is, I, I, I want to understand the place where I live. I want to understand the people uh, all around me and, and I want to understand myself. So I'm not into blaming, I'm not the better one, but I, I really just want to understand because my family history and my camp family history is turning me still to these moral questions. Um. This is just something you said that the musicality of poetry that you like to, um, since your poetry includes uh, quotations from witnesses, observers, and observations of murders, that the musicality of poetry alongside the unbreakable truth of history. It's a beautiful quote. Um, you've also said, I'm intrigued by the combination of ethics and aesthetics in one person, one life, and one story. So how does this combination work within you? And um, how do you work with the unbreakable truth of history? You know, I, I, I don't know. I, I think it's a good question for, for someone, somebody who, who knows me or who, who read my things. But I think that anyway, this combination of music and history and poetry is not a worse combination. I mean that, if you've got a sense of uh, music, then, then it's easier for you to, to create. And, and I, I think I've got some sense of, of, of history because of my family and, and I think I've got some sense of, 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 a, of a rhythm and, and of, a, of creating music and, and some musicality. So I think it's just you know, natural for me to, you know, to do what I do because when I, as I mentioned earlier, when I was young, I was in a musical school. So, you know, for me, playing was just obvious because I was playing, you know. Or for me, thinking about Second World War was natural because my family was involved, as almost all families in Poland. And because of, you know, because, and because I, I live in Gdansk, so the Second World War started in Gdansk. But there are so a lot of traces all around here and uh, of, 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 of Second World War still. And, and I think we are really very devastated society and uh, people full of traumas. And um, it's, it's, I'm really not into easy blaming and, uh, but, but I, I would like to really understand and, and, and to, to, to in, in some way to make some understanding message and, and, and some or, or even positive message, you know, I, I, I think that the, just by focusing on the dark side of history and human ability to murdering, we are not going to be worse people. But I think when you're, you've got the situation of lack of light, then you need a light. You know, when you see the horror all around, you need a fresh air. And I think that, for example, poetry 
which is focused on, on this dark horror side of your of human beings, it creates some moral uh, awakening uh, situation. So, so I mean, and the point is that I'm I'm really I'm really not writing for uh, readers, I'm, uh, or I'm not creating a music for listeners. I'm I, I'm really doing my own process. So so when I'm when I'm shocked by something, for example, by some some story I'm just you know in the poem it it, it it works on me I mean that very often I just read something and I'm you know frozen in the way oh my god what I what I would do in such situation you know of course I don't know that but so so I'm searching for this kind of edgy stuff because for me this edgy stuff was a family stuff and and, and but I've, I've, I've got this I, I guess so this ability to to play with music so to play the music, the poetry, or the band, so I think it's easy for me to to make this storytelling uh, process in not worst way. I hope so. <laughs> um, your your poems also explore the paradoxes of contemporary genocides, and um, I've done some reading on Rwanda, and it struck me when I was reading what I consider so far from what I've read, your most unbearable poem, Burning, which shows the daily horror of those who have to live next door to the people who committed atrocities, um, as occurred in Rwanda. I thought maybe you could read that poem for us. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, burning. Where is Isaac Moshe Vefa? They are all asleep here beneath this soil. Where are Rachela Stefan Alexander? They are all asleep beneath this soil. In Stawiski, in Tykocin, in Radziwów, in Czyżew, in Drohiczyn, in Jedwabne. He had butchered 18 Jews. He told me this in my apartment and as he installed my stove and the sun still shines upon his house and the generations of his family. You raped a Jewess behind the mill and then you slashed her throat. In the village, he is greatly respected, despite being a bachelor, despite being decrepit. And to this day, a sign hangs on his door, Jews, gypsies and devils not welcome. He hit a child with an iron rod, brain splattering upon his clothes and made its mother clean the mess. He worked in the fields, toiling, toiling late into the night. He was kind to his dying mother. Let us judge him not in his hour of need. They began beating her, turning her white body black. There was so much chaos in those days such everyday misdemeanors and transgressions might now seem something special. O oh Lord, O oh Lord, thou pluckest us from their hands, burning, burning in the barn, burning. You said, my problem is trying to understand evil, its presence and its purpose. What have you learned? Uh, year after year, year I am, I, I, I'm learning that, that you know, I, I shouldn't judge in an easy way and, I, and that, that the source of evil is, is inside of me. And I remember when I said to the guardian that I said, everyone, Every one of us has got Donald Trump inside of us, so we, we should watch out or we should be careful. But then I thought that maybe I even shouldn't say something like that about Donald Trump and calling him as a pure evil. You know what I mean? That of course, we have to protest. And of course, I think that Donald Trump is uh, on totally dark side of the morality. But, but, but. But but the but the point is what can we do with that? So by by you know of course we should be truthful as much as we can. But you know 
what are the solutions? You know, when you will say to someone, you are a bad man, you are an immoral man, you know, you know it's, it's, it's not the best way of communication. And, uh, and I think that, that so we, 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 should, we should remember about um, victims. We should protest against evil, but we should also trying to find a platform of communication and, and a way of communication. And um, so, so, so more and more year after year, I'm more focused not only about remembering and being as truthful as I can, but I'm thinking about what can we do to establish some um, bridge or some platform when we can meet and discuss with, with ourselves in, in some manner of dignity. Uh, and, you know, for example, in Poland, we've got, I guess, very similar situation to, to US, I, in the way that the society is super polarized, polarized and people, you know, half societies is uh, hating the other half and they are arguing in their families and everywhere and they are hating each other. And only one week ago or two weeks ago, there was a, some um, tabloid uh, um, published an article. It was about the um, birthday party of some journalists in Poland. And on this birthday party, there were politicians from the left side and right side, and they were drinking alcohol, you know, and they were all together. So I think that they, most of this evil stuff is a cynical populistic game, you know, ad addressed, we are, the other, we are the victims and, you know, they want us to hate each other in, in, in some way. And, and, and I don't want to be part of, of, of their, their cynical game. That's the point. What can we do to change it? For example, we can be conscious about that, that they are lying. You know, that for example, left-wing person is, is similar to right-wing person and vice versa. And in Poland, really a lot of left-wing, because of course my, my, my heart is rather or just on the left side, but you know, I, th I think that left side in Poland doesn't mean a real left side, but, but a lot of people on left side are are, are homophobic, etc. So, but anyway, you know, we have to find some connections, you know, and, and I don't know what to do, or, or, or maybe I know what to do. I think that the discussion is some, some solution, but, but yeah. Um, what is the role of mercy in all of this? I know that in our own conversations, the two of us, we've talked about radical love. Uh, maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, yeah. in some way, I, I started to, to, to say about it a bit, you know, a few minutes ago, but, you know, but because maybe this solution, only one week ago or two weeks ago, I was discussing it with uh, New York City professor, uh, Ruth Ben Giat, and she was asking me about radical love policy and uh, movement. So I started to think about it. And, and then I thought that very often uh, on these university events, I'm, I'm saying about, uh, I'm quoting the Beatles and, you know, all you need is love and, uh, or, or get uh, and more light, you know, and, and, um, because what is the other solution? No, that, 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 you know, to, you know, to make a love as a fundament of, of everything. Is there a better solution? You know, you know, uh, I don't know. I, I really don't think so. And then if, even Arthur Schopenhauer, because I, I, I admire his, his work and his pessimistic uh, point of view, but even Arthur Schopenhauer turned his, uh, uh, point of view on, on mercy and uh, on some um, light and, uh, yeah, and, and, and you know of course it's easy for me to say something like that and if you are a victim it's not easy to say all you need is love you know please forgive you, your your perpetrator so so I really know that I'm third generation and you know but on the other hand, I'm using this third generation distance to, to spread some uh, message because I think that if someone is very affected and if someone is just victim, you know, it's, for him very often it's very hard to speak about this 
hard topics because he's so traumatized and I'm not. So I think th this gives me this perspective and this gives me some uh, good, uh, yeah, good, good, yeah it, it, it gives me a kind of a freedom to, to, to say about this very paradoxical, maybe unsolved issues, but, but at least we can try. Um, we got two questions so far, and I invite everyone to submit their questions. Now is the moment. Um, so we have this question from Kurt Hoffman. Do you feel that the nature of the dynamics of the two sets of grandparents informs the way your work with Trupa Trupa vacillates between dark and light? I guess this is a Trupa Trupa fan. Uh, yeah. Mm, yeah, I, I think even if you if you see my face, that you know, you can see that my face is, is not a serious one. You know what I mean? That it's there. There, there is some pazzo element uh, in that, and uh, some uh, clown uh, figure. But, but, but yeah, I, I think that. Mm, I will say kind of a the, the big love, the, the atmosphere of love and friendship and created in the house of my my mother's house or so my grandparents from my mother's side. It gave me a, a strength and power and, and, and because of that, I'm really cheerful and I really enjoy and I'm enjoying life, you know what I mean? I'm really, I've got ADHD in some way, you know, that I'm, I'm making things very, you know, fast and rapidly and, you know, I, I'm full of energy and, I, I'm, and on the other hand, I, my, my point of view in the past, it was very pessimistic, but, but after born, my son was born, it, it changed because, because, because it changed because I, I, I met him and he's so great person. But yeah, I, I think that um, totally, it could, these this, uh, divisions totally creates my poetry and part of Trupa Trupa life because I'm not the only composer, I'm not the only author of lyric, lyrics, but, but of course this dynamic creates this art. And I think that without this dynamic, it could be boring or, or just obvious in some way, it would be just kind of a regular art, regular stuff. And I think that Um, it looks like, uh, Greg, it looks like you're frozen and um, we can't hear you. So, um, oh, there we are. We got you back. Welcome. <laughs> it, was, it was one big monologue. So that just, you know, internet made the right thing that it was one big monologue so so i don't know in one mo in what moment you lost me yes um I, about maybe a minute and a half ago so so i was talking and talking <laughs> and i was so smart and it was great it was great and then i and then i uh, saw a monitor and i said all right you know no one was hearing it. Yeah, I just said that it's, of course, this is very important for me. These two sides of energy and this dark side and light side, of course, it's, it's very important for Trupa Trupa and for my poetry and it creates some dynamic situation and, uh, and uh, some um, strange mixture that, that is some proposition for, for someone, yeah. Um, we have a question from Jenna Tetherin. Why do you think your audience, who generally hasn't had the same experiences of you as yourself, can still relate to your work? Mm, of course, I, I, I don't, firstly, I don't know. But secondly, if I would think about it more, I think that the, 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 
the, to the, the thing we discussed earlier, the, the tone of this work is very open for, for a reader or a listener because these are all a bit uncooked things. They, and I think that the listener or the reader is deciding, you know, for example, on which side he is or what is it really, you know, that, 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 and it, it works the same in the music and in the poetry that, that for someone, for example, it's just a situation that, that you've got a bones without skin, that it's not a real artistic body. But I think that the point is that someone is seeing the construction and only, only bones and he is making this whole construction by himself. You know what I mean? That I just making minimalistic signs and the, the reader is making the whole story for him. And I think this is the, the way that, that you can relate, it, relate to it because there is a lot of space for you to do it. Of course, you can reject it, but I think it's constructed in a very open way. Okay, we have a question from uh, Grace Keir. Thank you so much for this fascinating discussion. Does religion and or the religious environment of modern Poland impact your understanding of mercy in Poland and the other areas you focus on in your work? Does religion, the religious environment? Of modern yeah. Poland, okay. Of modern Poland, all right. It's something different than, yeah, yeah, because I was very inspired by San Francesco and, uh, and, and his biography and, uh, and when I was 14 years old, I wanted to be a San Francesco monk, etc. But, but it's not a modern Polish uh, religion. So, you know, I, I, I'm not inspired for sure. Uh, I'm anti-inspired. I, I, I don't know what, what to say. I think that that Polish Catholic institution has got a lot of, a lot of problems as Polish government. And, you know, I, but, but I don't want to... I guess I, I know what, what is the source of this problem and the source of this problem is not, 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 not facing the truth and the problems, but, but, but all right, but they are not inspired me in a, in a big way. Is, is it, or there is a word impact, all right. That's religion, the religious environment of modern world impact your understanding of mercy. I don't know, I don't think so. Okay, we have a question from Anna Pietrick. Um, uh, how do you feel about the way your poetry is perceived by the Polish literary critics? Do you feel understood in the country? Uh, which history, you whose history you've tried to understand? I, I was always lucky to be understood by old critics masters let's say so when I, when I when I started to publish one of my biggest promoter was my poetry was Henrik Bereza and then for example it was um, Jacek Bocheński and then it was uh, for the last book was uh, had great review by Leszek Szaruga or or I had kind of a um, imprimatur from uh, professor Michał Głowiński so I, I think it, it, it. I think that this poetry is really kind of a odd, weird stuff, as well as music. And to, I'm totally open for a critic situation and for negative reactions. But I, I think that that that, that generally speaking, the, the more I had more positive reactions than negative ones, and usually the very negative created some very after all, positive situations. So, and this is usually the way it is in Trupa in my poetry and in my private life that when something is, some, some negative things are happening then, and I've got some, let's say, problems and troubles, then the um, whole goodness is coming uh, on my way or I am com coming to the way of this goodness. So, 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 I really love to have, have the troubles and I really love to, I'm, I'm saying the whole truth. I, when, when I don't have the troubles, I, 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 I'm starting to worry, so. Okay. Um, we have room for one more question, if anyone's got one. No open questions. Um, ah, we just have somebody come in. Bihal Klinchevich. 
You mentioned that there are people whose trauma and pain is too difficult is difficult to express. This is perhaps particularly true for people in Poland who have a lot of trauma to process. You may be a voice for them. This seems like a heavy burden to carry for a poet and musician. How do you handle it? Are you worried by this responsibility? I I, I don't feel any responsibility really, because as I said, I, you know, I, I'm not overthinking this creation situation because I'm just doing what I have to do in the way that I'm really, when I'm writing a book, I really don't think what is the role of the book. I, I, I'm, I don't have a, a program. After all, when, I, when, I, when the book is written, I can think about the book and what can I do with this book? But, but I, I, you know, it's, 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 it's like uh, um, living in, I think that the, yeah, the Poland is a really traumatized situation. I think this is in some way land of the um, ghosts. And I think that the, this is kind of in some way the heart of the darkness and, uh, and, and one of the biggest genocide or the biggest genocide took place in the territory of Poland and it affects us in a big way. And I think this is like a living in some way on a cemetery or talking with ghosts. Uh, or trying to understand the ghost from the past, but I think it's so natural for us that it's uh, that we don't think I don't think about responsibility in the way that I'm just creating what I feel in the air and I just have to do it. Of course, I have to do it in the best way. So I I am worried about the formal aspects. You know what I mean? I, I'm worried about quality aspects more than about um, the issues because I just know that I have to write something and I have to say about something. But of course, I have to weigh the, the, the best form to do it in most anti-melodramatic way. And I think this is the, the, the biggest problem to find this neutral anti-melodramatic anti anti form to talk about such heavy issues. And I think this is whole secret to, to find this formula for, for talking about, tra for example, about traumas, not in a trauma way, but maybe even opposite way, just to you know, realize about something. Thank you for this question. Okay, I have- All the questions, sorry, yeah, yeah. I have a question. How does one understand the recent defacing of the Auschwitz camp with Nazi slogans? Anonymous attendee. Oh, I'm sorry, but that someone didn't say. Hmm. Oh, what can I say? I, 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 what, what do, hmm. How does one understand? I don't know. Is it a question for me? I I, I don't think so. I... You know, I don't know. How does one understand? Is it to me? Question to me? I, I, uh... Yeah. How does one understand the recent defacing of the Auschwitz camp with Nazi slogans? I guess what's going on in Poland today, etc. Yeah, I, I, I didn't read about it. Maybe I, I lost some some news, but we're talking about some Nazis. You know, I already said that in my opinion, Poland is still a very anti-Semitic country. So, so um, you know, that, that there are a lot of, especially in the 90s, there were a lot of uh, Jewish stars, which was just, you know, destroyed and, uh, on the walls and they were hanging. And, you know, there, there, there were a lot of these kind of things. And I remember when Trupa Trupa was recording because Trupa Trupa was recording one of the albums in the synagogue, the only not destroyed synagogue in the city of Gdansk. And when we were uh, recording it, as far as I remember, someone um, uh, destroyed the window just through the, the, the stone to the synagogue, something like that. So there were this kind of anti-Semitic accidents and I guess now we've got more of this kind of accidents. But anyway, I, didn't, I just didn't know about this dramatic situation from, yeah, from Auschwitz camp. But, you know, I, I think that, that, that it's, it's, it's terrible situation, of course. Okay. Um... Greg, it's been a pleasure having you here with us. 
uh, I'm excited about what you're doing, and I hope um, I hope you'll stay in touch with Stanford. You've but, got but sorry, I, I have to say one thing because for me this is great honor to talk with you and and your book about Czesław Miłosz in California. <laughs> you know, this is a great thing that is coming in uh, in October, and 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 the point is that but because for me Czesław Miłosz is one of the yeah I think this for me he is the biggest writer uh, in all time for all times in all times. And for me, <laughs> uh, yeah. So for me, this situation, you know, that that you that you are uh, talking with me is, you know, it's it's beyond everything I would imagine. Oh well, thank you. I thank you. I hope many readers agree with you because it's a fascinating topic. And he was here for longer than any else anywhere else in his life. He lived in California, and it's surprising how little it's talked about. So. Well, thank you, everyone. It's been a pleasure to have all of you here. Giovanna, and, uh, did you, sorry, because I'm, I'm, I'm starting my monologue mode, so please forgive me. But <laughs> I would like to thank, 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 thank Norman. I would like to thank Giovanna. I would like to thank John Connolly. And, you know, and, and it, the, my, my first university event was all, almost one year ago on, on Berkeley University. And, uh, and now we are here and I'm, and for me, in some way building this kind of a moral ethical platform where we can talk about it for me it's 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 just like a dream so i'm i'm super 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 thankful for for giving a chance for not promoting my poetry in my my art because i don't think it's it's the main point but but by promoting some anti hate speech message and and some you know some situation when we try to to understand uh, the past and, and the reality so 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 thank you so much thank you i would like to thank both of you on behalf of the center um for your conversation today uh, it really is a pleasure um, and an honor uh, to hear about your very important work that you're doing um and i thank you for sharing so freely about um your process and your experience uh, in doing so, and a special thank you uh, to you, Cynthia, as well, um, for facilitating this really um, dynamic discussion. So a wonderful um, start to, to our year here. We're so glad you could join us. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank have you, everyone. Have a great day and good night.